Hi students, welcome to Year 12 Chemistry and Module 5, Equilibrium and Acid Reactions. This is video number 19 and we're going to be talking a little bit about determining some of the solubility rules. In actual fact, most of what we're going to be doing here is trying to determine how we use these rules to tell us a little bit about what happens when uh, substances are dissolved in water. Now we know that not all ionic substances are equally soluble in water. Some are very, very soluble, some only slightly soluble, and some uh, dissolve to such small concentrations as to be virtually insoluble. So how do we know? Well, there's two main ways that we can determine whether or not a particular um, ionic substance is going to dissolve in water and also to what extent. The first one you will do in class. Obviously, we can't test every single combination of ions to determine whether they're all soluble and to what extent, but we will be able to run a range of different types of tests to give you an idea of which substances do actually form precipitates. And you've already started that process of looking at different types of precipitation reactions. The other way is to have a look at some of the rules for precipitates. If we can have a general way of trying to figure out when we have two substances being mixed together, whether we can eliminate some of the ions and see if what we have left over actually forms a precipitate, then that's probably the easiest way to do it. Up until now, most of these uh, ions have been given to you in tables, but we need to start to work on ways of seeing if we can memorize some of the general rules to just help us a little bit with some more common examples. One of the most important things when you are uh, carrying out this sort of activity is to identify the spectators. So there are certain ions which remain in the solution. They will not form a precipitate. Usually they don't form a precipitate at all, and therefore we can eliminate them from our uh, conversation. So the first thing that we need to do is if we have a combination of solutions such as potassium chloride and silver nitrate, then what we need to do firstly is say, okay, the um, potassium chloride is going to dissociate into potassium ions and chloride ions, and the silver nitrate is going to uh, dissociate into silver ions and nitrate ions. So that's all good. But then we need to have some rules. And those rules are the ones that are really important because they help us to determine um, what happens next. Well, one thing you may remember is the group one metals form soluble salts. So that means that potassium being a group one metal is always gonna form something that is soluble. So therefore it's not gonna be part of a precipitate. One other general rule that we, we may remember is that all nitrates are soluble. Therefore, nothing nitrate will form a precipitate either. So we have a nitrate over here, so it disappears. So our green um, circled substances over here are our spectators. They're going to remain in the solution um, and not form a precipitate, so we can eliminate them. So what that leaves us with, therefore, we have the silver iron and the chloride iron, and then we need to determine from the level of uh, solubility whether or not there will be a precipitate. If the concentration of ions is greater than the solubility, then we will have a precipitate. Now we need a couple more steps in order for us to actually quantify this. So let's look at this stage to see if we've got some general rules we can use. There's variations on these rules and it doesn't really matter which ones you pick as long as you have a way of remembering um, some of these key solubility rules. So the first thing we wanna look at is NAGSAG. Nitrates, acetates, group one ions, and we used two of those on the previous slide. We said that all nitrates are soluble, so that's important. Acetates, that's the ion that has two carbons, uh, a double bonded oxygen and an O minus, which is the um, anion of acetic acid or ethanoic acid. They're always soluble. 
and the group one ions are always soluble so that's sodium lithium potassium etc the sad part is sulfates ammonium and the group seven now when we get to these ones except for ammonia ammonia is a nice easy one because ammonium ions are always soluble but for the sulfates and the group seven they are always soluble except there are some exceptions so the nag sag are the general rules and our lms castro bar are our exceptions so if we look at the sulfates we can see that all of the sulfates are soluble with two groups of exceptions the first group of exceptions are our lms our lead ions our mercury ions and our silver ions LMS so that means that when we say sulfates are always soluble except these that would mean lead sulfate is insoluble it would form a precipitate and so would silver sulfate and so would mercury now this also has an exception for the Castro bar the Castro bar is calcium strontium barium these are group two metals and so they're an important group as well calcium sulfate strontium sulfate and barium sulfate each of these are also insoluble so we have our general rules and then we look at our exceptions barium sulfate would form a solid in the group seven um, elements or anions each of these is also soluble the exception again is the lms group so that means that silver chloride chlorine is one of our group seven elements they're all soluble but since silver chloride is an exception it will fall into that insoluble group it'll take a little practice for you to do this and of course I haven't talked about carbonates phosphates hydroxides or any of those yet and because they're not on the soluble list you can assume they are insoluble but again there's some exceptions this is a bit of a complex area of chemistry and some little tricks to help you remember are very important. So make sure you practice and just a quick shout out to Reese. Thanks for watching.